um, just to have the opportunity to take the time to pre to to really dig into to um, the writings and um, think about whiteness and white supremacy um, from a critical whiteness perspective, and then using that to really deeply understand the writings of Shoghi Effendi and what he means when he talks about um, you know what we have inherited from our nation and what does that look like and so it, it really has been a great opportunity and I just want to welcome everyone a couple things that I want to mention if you have a question please hold it to the end of the presentation we'll take the questions at the end of the presentation we will not be taking questions that have been asked in the chat so please hold your questions and ask them in the space. And the reason why we're not doing that is because oftentimes when questions are posed in the chat, then it kind of diminishes the quality of the discussion that could happen within the actual space of the presentation. And so what I would ask is for you to hold your questions so that you can ask them within the space of this forum and um, and then we can we can really engage with the question within the space and have more enriching conversations. And then lastly, I just want to ask everyone um, to to remember that we're all noble beings and we all deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And these are very difficult conversations. And so, you know, sometimes it's very our emotions can get the better of us. And so if that happens, I just really ask you um that to be respectful all views in this space are welcome and i think the beauty of baha'i consultation um, brings the spark of truth and so as long as we can do this in a respectful way i think that um, we will gain a lot out of it and i welcome everybody's views um, within the context of this space and the and the topic that we're discussing all right, and uh, Jeanette will be my helping me with tech. So I won't be able to see any chats or a hands up or anything like that. So just hold off um, till the end of the presentation. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see? I, I can't see anybody right now. Um, can everybody see? Can someone unmute themselves and tell me what they're seeing? Are they seeing my notes or are you just seeing a screen with um, the slide. just the slide? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Wonderful. Um, so the presentation is called Breaking Free of an Epistemology of White Ignorance. And as most of you know, my name is Liz Allen, and um, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. My specific focus is understanding, um, uh, understanding how white teachers employ aspects of whiteness to perpetuate white hegemony in K through 12 education. I wanna be able to see your faces, but I don't know how to do that. Hold on one second. I guess it, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so um, my parents answered the call to pioneering in the 1970s and they dedicated their lives to serving the Baha'i faith and they created a strong spiritual heritage as a result. So my sister was born in Togo and I was born in Gabon. So in this picture, and the picture of the National Spiritual Assembly of Togo, my father is in the bottom right hand corner. And in the first National Assembly of Gabon, my mother is in the top left corner. So from birth, I was completely immersed within the Gabonese culture. We lived a, in a Gabonese neighborhood, attended their public schools and became part of the community to the extent that that was possible. So my earliest memories are connected to being held, passed around from lap to lap, and just raised by the Gabonese community. And so from this context, I just wanted to share my positionality. So culturally, I strongly identify with the Gabonese culture. Ethnically, I have mostly German and Irish roots, and racially, I identify as white. 
So as a second generation pioneer, I feel the need to pursue my own investigation of reality and ask difficult questions. So not for the purpose of creating disunity or to cause trouble, but to investigate truth. One difficult question I continue to wrestle with is to question how my family could have engaged, for example, in white saviorism and what that looked like in our, in our case. So when we would visit the US, I struggled to find ways to convey to my non-Baha'i grandparents my life experiences raised in all Black communities. I also became a witness to the ways my grandparents would say racial things in non-racial ways. So for example, our non-Baha'i grandparents forbade us to go across the street to make friends in a mostly Black neighborhood, stating that they didn't want neighbors knowing them. And when they were gone for the winter, um, they would leave their house unoccupied for maybe four months. So I myself had to piece together the implicit racist message that Blackness equaled criminality. And so I give these examples to show you how in my own life I experienced whiteness and white supremacy. And so these experiences in some ways pushed me into academia, where as a single mother scholar, I have to choose how to live my life. I have to decide which questions I'm courageous enough to ask in order to pursue my own investigation of reality, in order to wrestle with my family history, and I have to teach my daughter to think critically, ask difficult questions, and develop a relationship with Baha'u'llah and the covenant. And so the questions I, asked, I find myself asking within the context of the Baha'i faith and the guardian's call for pioneering are, one, how do we navigate our spiritual legacies with the understanding that we are all imperfect human beings? And for me specifically, how do I honor my family history of serving the cause of the Baha'i faith while simultaneously wrestling with the ways my family engaged in white saviorism? I'm often asked why I spend my time and energy presenting on whiteness and white supremacy instead of focusing on whiteness, on oneness, right? So, and I'm just going to give you 10 seconds to read the quote. So Baha'u'llah says that the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. But we cannot achieve justice if we don't educate ourselves on the problems of the world that are the cause of injustice and inequity. Our beloved Universal House of Justice in their July 22nd, 2020 letter to the Baha'is of the United States reminds us that the American Baha'i community cannot hope to either escape the trials with which this nation is confronted, nor claim to be wholly immune from the evils that stain its character. And so what does that mean practically? This is what we're going to kind of look into and engage in today. And so the goal of today's presentation is really to synthesize the Baha'i writings with current critical whiteness studies research, so as to gain a better understanding of whiteness and whites' false sense of superiority. And so uh, just to emphasize here, this synthesis is based on my own understanding. And so I want to start, I want to start the presentation with this question. Can you think of any situation where ignorance is knowledge? And so I don't want you to answer it right now, but I would like you to keep it at the back of your mind as we go through the presentation. And this question really is central to my presentation. So can you think of any situation where ignorance is knowledge? The Guardian reminds us in the advent of divine justice, how great therefore, how staggering the responsibility that must weigh upon the present generation of the American believers to weed out by every means in their power those faults, habits, and tendencies which they have inherited from their own nation. White supremacy is a social, political, and economic system that we have inherited as a nation for the purposes of preserving the land, wealth, and power white men have accrued by colonizing North America, 
with the use of slaves as its foundation. The system was developed based on the process of racialization, which is the hierarchical classification of people by the color of their skin and phenotypical differences. Dorothy Lang, um, who took this picture called There's No Way Like the American Way in 1937, this picture shows black men and women in Louisville, Kentucky, lining up to seek food and clothing from a relief station in front of a billboard proclaiming world's highest standard of living. This was taken during the Great Ohio River Flood of 1937. So what I find interesting about this picture is how it clearly shows the advantages and resources the white collective are encouraged to accrue at the expense of the lives of people of color. Given the historical context of 1937 and Jim Crow laws, it is clear that this billboard encourages or brainwashes whites to believe that they need to achieve the world's highest standard of living. But what isn't stated is that it was impossible to achieve the standard of living without buying into the white supremacist system built on the backs of chattel slavery, land stolen from indigenous people, using the legal system to determine who was white and who could therefore be paid less or not at all, so that a white minority could be paid more. James Baldwin reminds us that white men became white by slaughtering the cattle, poisoning the wells, torching the houses, massacring Native Americans, and raping Black women. As we all know, resources and land are limited, and so every unearned advantage and privilege we, or whites, have benefited from have been advantages and resources taken away from people of color. And this stark difference can be seen in what the billboard is advertising to the white collective versus the reality of people of color on the ground after the Great Ohio River Flood of 1937. These unearned privileges and advantages have historically accrued and continue to perpetuate inequities in our nation today as it pertains to job opportunity, income, healthcare, housing, schooling, and so on. What I've mentioned is just the tip of the iceberg. My point here is that structural and institutional racism is inherent in the white supremacist economic system because it was built to advantage one group over another for the purposes of economic growth and power. I use this as the backdrop to my presentation because I want to acknowledge that our current system is based on white supremacy and perpetuated through the dominant racial ideology of our time, which is whiteness. So I'm not here to prove this to you because this has been substantiated through research. And my goal for today is to synthesize the current critical whiteness discourse on whiteness and on white supremacy in parallel with Baha'i writings so as to better understand where we stand as a nation and specifically as white people in order to deconstruct where this false sense of superiority comes from. And so I want to emphasize here, this is what we have inherited as a nation. Um, for those who have been coming to my presentations for a while, you're familiar with this chart, and I like to use it. It's from um, Cheryl Matias's book called Feeling White. And it gives you kind of a visual of the white supremacist framework. So I framed this discussion with the understanding the whiteness and white supremacy are the disease, right? So we think of whiteness and white supremacy as the disease and racism the symptom. And so for this presentation, our focus will be on the disease and not so much the, the symptom, which is racism. And so as you can see from this chart, white supremacy impacts whites and people of color differently. It can impact people of color through racism and whites through whiteness, which is whiteness, and I'm, I will define all these terms, which is um, an, a current, it's defined in different ways, but the academic literature defines, this, it defines it as white ideology. So whiteness can also impact people of color in a variety of ways, which I will not focus on in today's presentation. 
it is difficult to have conversations about race without defining specific terms. So I've already defined white supremacy as a system um, based on stratification of skin color for the purposes of economic growth and power. What I do want to emphasize here is the difference between racism versus prejudice, because this comes up a lot in different um, conversations. So prejudice is a pre preconceived negative opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. So whites can be prejudiced towards blacks and blacks can be prejudiced towards whites. Racism um, is any prejudice against someone because of their race when those views are reinforced by systems of power. So many of you have probably heard this idea that black people can't be racist towards white people, but white people are inherently racist towards black people, right? And so the reason why, why that is stated in the way that it is, it's because um, they're thinking about the definition of racism as systems of power. And so even if a black person experiences prejudice towards a white person, it's not, it's not going to have the same impact because they don't, from a structural and institutional racism perspective, they're not going to have the power to oppress in the way that, for example, a white person would have the power to oppress because the power is in their hands. And so that's the distinguishing factor. One group believes that they are superior over another because um, they believe that they possess the distinct characteristics, abilities, or qualities that are used to justify who would have access to land, wealth, and power. So in the United States, white men specifically hold the majority of positions of power as it regards economic, social, and political decision-making. Just recently in the news, I can't see anyone right now, I'm sorry, but um, just recently in the news, there's an article that just came out that talked about how, I think it's the New York Times, um, how 80% of the positions of power are currently held by, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's either white people or white men specifically. Um, and so that's something to think about, right? When we think about power and who, whose power um, are, they are in the hands of who. Sorry. Okay. And so um, the last thing I want to talk about is whiteness, which I will continue to, to define in a minute. So just remember, whiteness doesn't refer to white people. So this is where I want to clarify. When I use the word whiteness, I'm not talking about white people. I'm talking about a specific ideology, a specific anti-Black ideology that exists to sustain this white supremacy framework and system. So what is racial ideology? Um, so Benilla Silva describes ideology, so not racial ideology, but ideology specifically, as these broad mental and moral frameworks that social groups use to make sense of the world, to decide what is right or wrong, true or false, important or not important. And so Benilla Silva is, this, um, is an academic um, in, and he actually teaches at Duke. Um, ideologies, right, so thinking about ideologies, they provide basic guidelines with which people filter through often confusing and conflicting information so as to make sense of our social reality. So these are kind of, they're not specific, but they're mental and broad moral frameworks. Racial ideology is a specific type of ideology, right? And so these would be racially based frameworks that are used to either justify the dominant narrative or to challenge the dominant narrative. So for example, <clears throat> excuse me, Omi and Renant em emphasize, who, there are also academics that have written a lot on, on ideology, the collective nature of racial ideology and explain that the ways in which it functions affects our consciousness in our daily life. <clears throat> So specifically in the ways we decide who we choose as friends, who we want to marry, what neighborhood we want to live in, and what is considered knowledge and truth, moral or not, and deserving or not, in order to maintain the racialized social structure, right? So it affects our consciousness in very subtle ways and influences the decisions that we make, right? And so a question that I like to think about is how does racial ideology affect our, our consciousness? How does racial ideology even 
influence the way we interpret Baha'i writings or any writings that we're reading, right? These filters that we've been immersed in our whole life, how does that influence us? And so whiteness as an ideology, specifically, right, um, this whiteness that I'm talking about, it's used to justify the dominance narrative. And, I, and, and uh, an example of a counter ideology would be um, critical whiteness studies, which I'm synthesizing right now, critical race theory, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute because it was in the news recently. Um, and so whiteness is this dominant ideology that's in our, in our communities and, and everywhere, right? And it justifies and it's used to justify the dominant narrative, which we're gonna talk about. <clears throat> so how is whiteness and white racial ideology perpetuated? Um, if white supremacy as a system and whiteness as the racial ideology is inherited, right, this is something that we have inherited from our nation, that it is only logical to begin to ask how whiteness is perpetuated to sustain this white supremacist system. If we've inherited it and it keeps being perpetuated, then let's start to understand how it's being perpetuated. So I want you to take a minute to look at this picture. So you see the phrase, it's the American way. You see the phrase freedom or of religion and speech. You see opportunity, private enterprise, representation of democracy. I also want you to notice that this picture was taken in 1940. So think about the billboard within the historical context of 1940. This was the time of Jim Crow. So one, we need to ask, ask ourselves, who, was this, who is this billboard targeting? We know that it's targeting white people, right? Because in the time of Jim Crow, we know that there was an access to opportunity, there was an access to private enterprise, um, there wasn't freedom, right, for people of color. And so what is missing in this picture? What this billboard is really saying is it's the white American way. We are omitting in this billboard the crucial term white, but we do mean white, right? From the historical context. And so for those who have watched The Color of Fear, which is a documentary that I highly encourage everyone to watch, it clearly portrays the frustration and anger that black Americans feel when whites assume that they have the same opportunities because it's the American way. The billboard perpetuates the myth that it is possible for the black American to truly assimilate into white spaces. And we know that in 1940, that wasn't true when the backbone structure of this country is based on racialization and whiteness. And so if you think of this type of racial ideology is not being used anymore to brainwash the public, let's think again. So on July 16, 2020, um, less than maybe two months ago, the Washington Post published this news article titled, Pompeo says, protesters and mainstream media are attacking the American way of life. In his speech, he reminds the public of the American way of life and its founding principles. The goal was to stir up the emotion of white nostalgia, of remembering the past as it was and wishing things were the way they used to be. That is the semblance of this white America. Our president does, does this through his use of the phrase, make America great again, right? He's, he's, he's pulling on the same kind of nostalgic emotions, white emotions. And so Pompeo goes on to state, and yet today the very core of what it means to be an American, indeed the American way of life itself is under attack. Instead of seeking to improve America, leading voices promulgate hatred of our founding principles. So let's think about how he's twisted those words, right? And is, and is enticing the public. So in this example, we see a political figure who's employing a specific type of rhetoric using historical narratives to manipulate white emotions and spread misinformation so as to instill fear in the American public and incite the white collective to project their fear onto protesters and the mainstream media. 
And this is how many US citizens are brainwashed and truth is masked. So in this instance, we need to determine, determine who's not, whose narratives dominate and whose narratives are being oppressed when this is, when, when these type of news, um, when, when Pompeo would say something like this. And so I want you to take a minute and to think about the storylines you've been taught to repeat for the purposes of masking reality. And once again, I wanna emphasize, this is what we have inherited as a nation that Shogi Effendi clearly talks about in his writings, right? That this is part of our inheritance as part of this country. And so I wanted to use one recent example, which I included after the ABS presentation, which was recently in the news. Um, another way that whiteness is perpetuated, right? Um, President Trump targets white privilege training in federal agencies as anti-American. So let's think about this word anti-American. Let's not think about what anti-American is, but let's think about what, he's, what he is um, emphasizing or subtly referring to when he means American, right? So it says, Donald Trump has directed the Office of Management and Budget to crack down on federal agencies anti-racism training sessions, calling them divisive anti-American propaganda. And he goes on to list any kind of anti-racist training that brings up white privilege, anti-racist tra training that uses critical race theory, which I just talked about, right? That is, a, that is a racial ideology that goes against the dominant white racial ideology. And so we can see in the mainstream media and we can see how um, from a political perspective, um, whiteness is being perpetuated and they're trying to squell and squash um, um, opposing or resistant uh, ideologies that push back against uh, whiteness. So um, I just, I just also want to emphasize um, one of the ways in which um, colorblind ideology is perpetuated is through colorblind, uh, sorry, one of the ways whiteness or white racial ideology is perpetuated is also through what we call um, colorblind ideology, which, which I have presented on before. And so colorblind ideology is designed, and I'm just, I just want to say, I'm synthesizing literature here. Uh, colorblind ideology, Bonina Silva talks a lot about, um, and the point here is just to show you different ways in which um, this racial ideology is perpetuated. So colorblind ideology is designed to mask inequity by making it seem like race doesn't matter anymore. That's the purpose of colorblind ideology, right? And so we, we are, we've been taught to spread false knowledge by saying things like race doesn't matter anymore. We are all equal or I don't see color which is ironic, right? Because for someone to feel the need to proclaim that they don't see color, they have to have seen color first. And so um, another, another way that, <clears throat> that colorblind ideology, whose purpose, and I just wanna emphasize this again, um, is to mask or to hide inequity, right, by making it seem like race doesn't matter anymore. That's what colorblind ideology is not is about. It's not just about saying, not saying, I don't see color, right? It's, it's about how do we mask it? What kind of ter terminology, what kind of words do we use to mask the inequity? That's the whole point of colorblind ideology. And so um, the, another way that colorblind ideology, one, another technique, tactic is storylines, right? Which have also been documented through research. Um, and a common one that I like to use is, I come from a family of immigrants. We worked hard, we made something out of ourselves. I don't understand why people of color can't also pull themselves up by their bootstraps. If we made it, then why can't they make it, right? And so I want to emphasize that we've been taught these techniques, right? Historically, through whiteness, we've been taught to repeat and perpetuate these storylines that race doesn't matter anymore. But in between the lines, we say racial things in non-racial ways. And so storylines are documented stories we are taught to tell to emphasize this idea that race doesn't matter anymore. And so this immigrant story is a very common one, right? 
And um, what I want to emphasize here with this story is that um, what, what is not being said is that only immigrants who were considered white, because the Supreme Court got to decide, right, who would fall under the white umbrella and the people who would fall under the white umbrella and who owned land back in the day would have very specific rights and access to wealth, access to land in ways that those who did not fall under the white umbrella didn't have access to work, right? So that's not even mentioned here, but we perpetuate these stories because they kind of make sense to us, but we're not really thinking about the historical background of why it was that, for example, my family of immigrants were able to work and work hard. Yes, we all worked hard and made something out of ourselves. It was because they were granted the ability to fall under the white umbrella, right? This white term that the Supreme Court deemed, um, I'm maybe I, I, I'm a German and Irish immigrant. And so I fell under that umbrella. Therefore, I was able to work in a way that other uh, immigrants, you know, when the Irish first arrived or the Jews, they didn't fall under the white umbrella, right? And so over time, the, the definition of whiteness changed um, based on what would serve the Supreme Court best in terms of how to, how to hoard resources. And so that's really important to know, and there's some great books out there. So what is insidious about whiteness is the way these storylines are passed on and we believe that we are sharing the story as an individual, right? How many times have I said this as an individual? Oftentimes not realizing that we're taught them for this specific purpose, which is to perpetuate the myth that race doesn't matter anymore. And therefore, if inequities exist, it must be the fault of people of color. The purpose of these storylines is to mask systemic, structural, and institutional racism, right? So this is intentional. And so semantic moves, which is another way to think about colorblind ideology, um, are, are moves that we, strategic moves that we use in our language to say racial things in non-racial ways. So it involves inco incoherent arguments, illogical statements, right? So a common one that we hear all the time is, I'm not racist, but, and then that's followed by an extremely racist statement, right? So, but, I think diversity, or another one is, I think diversity is important, but I don't want uh, to move into this diverse neighborhood because it is high crime. So what you're saying is, you're saying a very racist thing in a non-racist way, so as to mask the underlying purpose, which is to, to, to emphasize that really it's a black neighborhood, right? But you're not calling it a black neighborhood. And you're equating blackness with criminality, which we know is an issue right now in our country. And so uh, another example would be, I believe that we should all learn to live together, but I think it is a bad idea to marry this black man because our cultures will clash. It is only natural for people of the same race to be attracted to one another and stick together. This is another way, right, that we perpetuate um, racism. We're saying something very racist, but we're phrasing it in a non-racial way. Um, or we would say like, oh, because they just don't understand our ways. What does that even mean, right? And so we need to think about how we repeat these arguments that were taught um, over time. Another way that whiteness um, is perpetuated is through uh, white emotions, which is, um, I like to think of white emotions as, we as a weapon, right? We weaponize white emotions. Um, in very dangerous ways. And so I'm gonna show you a video of Amy and Chris Cooper. And you know, this is a very contentious video because a lot of people feel very, very strongly about this video. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background information. So Amy and Chris Cooper are having an altercation as the dog owner and birder in the Ramble, a space in Central Park, which is designed to protect endangered vegetation. So dogs are expected to be leashed because they destroy the endangered vegetation. So as a birder, there was a movement to document dog owners breaking the dog on leash rules. So Chris Cooper started recording the vigil to document the dog off leash, right? But Amy, and you're gonna see in this video, took what would have been an altercation between two people and escalated it to make it about race. And so this is, this is the point that I wanna make. And the, 
another reason why I want to use this example, because oftentimes we want to use black and white examples like, oh, this is clearly the bad guy, this is or this is clearly the bad woman, and this is clearly the good guy, right? In this video, it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray area in terms of whatever the altercation was happening and who was right or wrong. And the reason why I want to use this video is because regardless of who was right or wrong, the point is that Amy took it and escalated it and made it about race. It originally wasn't about race and she took it and made it about race. And that's the important point that I want us to check, to, to look. So when, he's, when he started video, video recording her, he wasn't recording her because she was going off on him. He was recording her because she had her dog off leash and was trying to document that. Would you please stop? Sir, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. I'm taking pictures of calling the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me? So notice that's when she started making it about race, right? When she said, I'm gonna tell them that there's an African American man threatening my 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 life, that's when she makes it about race. I'm sorry, I'm in the ramble and there is a man, African American, he has a bicycle helmet. He is recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. And my. I'm sorry, I can't hear. So notice how she escalates her voice and really weaponizes her, her emotions, right? I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the ramble. I don't know. Thank you. So notice that when she leashes her dog, he stops recording because the purpose of the recording was to show the, an unleashed dog, right? Um, because that was the purpose of him starting as a birder and their, I, I don't know what organization it was. Um, and so I want, I want us to think about this video from a white historical perspective. You have a black man, right? And this is the way maybe that she's think, Amy Cooper is thinking about this. A black man dares put a white woman in her place, right? In her place by asking her to follow the rules she thinks she's entitled to break, right? And as a white woman, I can tell you right now, I think I'm entitled to break so many rules because of the white privilege I've been taught to think, oh, not a big deal, you know? So what if I have to have a dog on a leash? Not a big deal, I'll break the rule. And if someone comes up and, you know, if a cop comes up and tells me to put my dog on a leash, I'll do it, you know? And we don't even have, we're not scared about going to, to jail because most likely a cop, because we're white, um, will just, you know, give us a warning or just verbally tell us not to do that again and move on, um, maybe a little lecture. And so this is very common. And so viewed from a historical perspective and the way she employed race, right, she made it about race, Amy Cooper is outraged that a black man would ask her to leash her dog and believes she's entitled to unleash her dog and use, she uses her white authority, right, to call the cops, weaponizing her white emotions to put him in his place. And so we know that the history of policing was based on originally policing um, uh, slaves, right, um, and, and enforcing black codes. So in, at night, um, the, the police officers were actually um, told to, um, to look for runaway slaves. So that was one of their main um, their, one of their main functions when the police force was, was, was uh, started and to enforce black codes. So we know historically as white women that cops were designed to oppress black people and to, and to protect white people. This is a historical thing that has happened and has been documented through research. And so this is what she's doing, right? And so from a white supremacy, this is how a white supremacist framework works. We employ white emotions so that we can put black people in their place 
And so historically, we've been taught to do this as white women, and it is an effective way to control black and brown bodies when we think they are getting out of line. And so once again, this is the way the white supremacist framework is reinforced and perpetuated. And so thank God that it didn't work this time and that there was a video recording. And so we often employ white emotions because we don't want to take responsibility. So for the shame we experience at knowing that we did something wrong. So I'm digging in a little bit deeper here as a white woman, right? Oftentimes, rather than deal with my own shame, I just want to project it onto other people. We do this all the time as humans, right? And so rather than her accept and, and, and realize that she's doing something wrong, she wants to project that rage. She suppresses the shame and projects the white rage, the white fear and the anger onto people of color rather than deal with it and work through the shame. And so imagine a world where white people would start working through their shame. And this is a point that I want to that I just want to reinforce because we oftentimes demonize this idea of white emotions, but we don't dig deep. And so until, until we as individuals can start working through our own shame and our own guilt, right? So rather than suppressing it, really working through it and not project it, right? Not weaponize our emotions and project it onto people of color. I think we, we, we would start seeing a better world. And so um, lastly, I just want to say white supremacy is the cause of death, right? It's dangerous and deadly. Some people could, would have said that Amy Cooper attempted second degree murder, right? In this instance, with the way she employed her white emotions and weaponized them and called the cops, right? And so we have inherited this as a nation. I, as a few other ones which I'm not going to get into today are um, this idea of white entitlement. Um, another one that we see a lot lately is the white gaze and surveillance, which I'm not going to get into today, but I do want to emphasize that there's a, this idea of surveillance that happens, right? So in Mr. George Floyd's case, in the murder of Mr. George Floyd, it was eight minutes and 46 seconds of white supremacy being imposed on his black body. And so all of these are elements that are interlocking to support the system. So when we think about colorblind ideology, white emotions, the way we employ white authority, the way we, we employ white entitlement, um, the white gaze and surveillance, right? How we're constantly surveilling people of color in our day-to-day -day lives at an institutional level, um, at a structural level, mass incarceration. Um, and then this idea of other examples, right? How we, um, how we employ reverse racism, right? And, and pretend like we're the victims. So affirmative action and the, the, the court cases around affirmative action where white people say, I was deprived of a spot um, at a university because of affirmative action. I deserved it, but it was given to someone less deserving uh, with a different skin color, right? And so, that's not, first of all, that's not true um, because of the way uh, white privilege works, right? Um, and I can get into that in, in a little bit. But all of these are interlocking elements that support the system, that come together, that research has shown supports the system and perpetuates whiteness, which is hate. <clears throat> And uh, another one is, you know, who gets to determine what is and what is not racist. That's another one that um, also perpetuates racial ideology. So I want to transition into another field, into uh, some other literature in critical whiteness studies that talks about ignorance. So the official dic dictionary definition of ignorance is lack of knowledge or information. That's the official definition. And uh, you'll, you'll clearly see why I'm using, I'm showing this right now, later. <laughs> um, so Charles Mills, who's really one of my favorite authors, he's brilliant, he's really hard to read, um, but he is good at what he does. Um, so he wrote a book called The Racial Contract in 1997. And the racial contract, essentially, just briefly, a summary of it is, he, he essentially said that there's this contract that has been forged between whites who present a way of being in the world that ignores racial subordination. 
And so what does that mean? So as whites, we feign ignorance. Um, there's this group, individual or group-based suppression, right, of collective knowledge, which we saw um, colorblind ideology is a good example of how that's done, right? We're all equal, you know, repeating that phrase when we say we are all equal means that we're ignoring, right? This is this racial contract, this informal racial contract that has been forged between whites that tell us to ignore the, what is really happening in the world and ignore the racial subordination and pretend like everything is okay and say that we are all equal right? That after civil rights, everybody now has an equal opportunity to get work and to do all this stuff. And so it ignores racial subordination. And so there's this contract that has been formed. And in this book, he talks about it, right? It feigns ignorance. We pretend that we don't know. And we, we present um, facts, right, that suppress collective knowledge to present a way of being in the world that ignores racial subordination. And so this creates a certain norm normativity, um, and certain specific norms as, so as not to ask questions. Like we don't question the stories that we are told. The immigrant story is a good one. Like how many of us have really sat down and questioned, you know, the stories that have been repeated in our families? We don't question it because that's a way in which we've been taught to ignore things. When we ignore them, we ignore racial subordination, we ignore inequity, we ignore subordination, we're able to move on with our lives um, and not think about it. And so um, we see the true, re so uh, another thing that I wanna emphasize, we're taught to misrepresent this reality, right? In order not to break the contract. And so when we think back at Pompeo, the example of Pompeo, He's misre misrepresenting reality in order not to break this contract, right? That ignores the racial subordination that's happening. And so we say racial things or pass on racial knowledge in non-racial ways. So, you know, some examples that I already gave, I don't want you marrying this man, really it's black man, because our cultural differences will cause disunity. So that's one, right? We're ignoring, and we're passing on racial knowledge in non-racial ways. I don't want you living in this neighborhood because it's high crime. What they mean is black neighborhood. I don't like the idea of diversifying this neighborhood, meaning more people of color coming in, because it will bring all sorts of people into the neighborhood and crime, and it will bring down the value of our house, right? It'll become a dangerous neighborhood. Um, other ones are black people are lazy and don't work hard. Um, Black women have a lot of children in order to benefit from the welfare system. Um, that's a, the welfare queen um, stereotype. So there are all of these um, ways or phrases or storylines that we've been taught to repeat and believe that ignores racial subordination, that ignores um, the truth, so as to perpetuate a white supremacist framework. I didn't get this job because that I applied for because a black person applied for it and got it, right? And so <clears throat> here's what I want to ask you. How are white people expected to react in these instances? So part of the contract is to act white and not to break from the invisible contract, right? So for example, if we choose not to act white, what would that look like? What would it be, what would be the consequences if we didn't pretend to agree? If we didn't repeat the storylines we've been taught to repeat, what would happen, right? So I want us to start thinking about it because I think ultimately, uh, bottom line, this is what Shogi Effendi is really asking us to do, is how do we um, start thinking about how do we break away from this false sense of white superiority that we've been taught and it's ingrained in us, how do we start not acting white? So for example, pushing back, right? Standing up for us, for, for saying, no, actually that's not true, you know? And explaining why it's not true or explaining why saying such things is harmful and ignores the reality of racial subordination. And so what does it mean to be a race traitor in this sense, right? To choose not to act right. And so I'm gonna show you an example here. And I'm not gonna show the whole video, video because we don't have time. But this is an example, this is Haley Clark. Some of you may have seen this video. Um, 
And this is an example of her breaking the racial contract by pushing back on her parents and ultimately taking this video and posting it on social media, so outing her parents. And so there was actually a rumor that Haley Clark ended up in jail, right, for outing her parents. And we know that that's possibly true. I was never able to substantiate it, but she broke that informal white racial contract and upset a lot of people. Do you know how many people- I actually, no, shut up. No. Can you shut your mouth for a minute? No. Because I actually work in the ghetto. I see the people. Do you know why I they're in that position? Like I see these people. Do you understand the systematic and historical reason for why they're in that position? They don't care. All they want to do is be ghetto. No. Yes, there's no. some that don't and there's good people. No. Members, most of them just want to suck off the system or do something bad like drugs or gangs. And that's all they They have about. been oppressed. They have it not been given matter. the same the opportunities chances. you have yes, had. They do. And there's plenty of black people. No, they don't, there's plenty Dad. Of, there's plenty of money and you not recognizing that as an issue is the reason why it's still continuing today. I see them all over. There's all kinds of successful people that are of color. It doesn't matter what color, brown, white. But it's orange, a lot harder yellow. for them to get to that it position. It doesn't matter. When they do, they're fine. But there's always filthy animals. And that you're, calling, you're calling people of color black no. animals you're calling them animals I'm you didn't let are me you finish. kidding me, you didn't let me that, finish. that's not okay no no matter what that's not okay no matter what it's it not okay. okay racism is not okay why do you think the racism is okay <laughs> I found this. All right. that, oh that's mine really i'm gonna look at no i'm looking no, at that, statistics that's my right now. Get your statistics can't they can be warped. Statistics can be warped. You want to show? You want me to show you videos? So why are my do you want me to show you videos of cops? Why is why I will are, do why it. Is statistics wrong? Because they can be warped. I'm not giving statistics right now. They can be warped. Personal experiences can't. No, because this is actually putting it into play. When you, do I need to show you a bunch of videos of cops attacking protesters, peaceful protesters? Just listen, listen to this. This is the number. You mean I'm informed and educated? You're not though. You're, yes, I am. You're one-sided informed. Mom, I was watching political stuff and you said to turn that off because you don't want to hear about it. Because that I'm means I am educated it. on it and you are not. It. I'm sick of hearing it. The fact that you can have that ignorance, really, ignorance for the majority is bliss. Okay. So ignorance for the minority. So I'm is looking at statistics destruction. that are wrong. This is just pure wrong information out there. Just give me the statistic. In 2017, 457 white people were shot to death by the police in the United States. Okay. 223 were black. 76% of the population is white. 13% is black. I if, that. if they were being killed at the exact same rate by police officers, the rate of black people being killed would be 8.9. But it's not. It's 24%. The rate of white people being killed should be about where it is. So they're being killed at a higher rate. There is more white people, meaning that the amount of people killed by cops who are white would be higher. The reaction of the person. So I just want to stop it there. Um, obviously, I'm not condoning yelling and screaming at each other, but I think this is a good example of the way in which what we would call not acting white. So breaking what Haiti Carlark is doing right now is breaking the social contract. And so I encourage everyone in their own personal life to think about ways in which we can start breaking this, this racial contract, this informal racial contract that has been forged within um, between white people to act a specific way. And um, I have another example um, that one of my friends shared with me, and um, I just want to share it because I think it's a good real life example. He was at his dental hygienist and the, the dental hygienist made the following statement. I wish the police had some kind of device that would shut down cell phones around them so that these recordings could not be made. So this is a dental hygienist talking, a white one, a white person, talking to my friend who's also white, right? Um, who thinks that this, my friend is a safe white person, someone who has signed this invisible white contract and thinks that it's okay to say, 
I wish the police had some kind of device that would shut down cell phones around them so that these recordings could not be made. And so at this point, if we encounter a situation like this, right, my friend had a choice. He can choose how to act white, which is maybe to kind of laugh about it, kind of maybe say, yeah, you know, you're probably right, or giggle or do something kind of awkward, or he could choose not to act or, you know, maybe follow up with something racist, um, some kind of joke, or he can choose not to act white. And so what does that look like, right? How do you choose not to act white? He reacted in shock and responded that he thought it was important these videos were made, right? Because um, it shows the truth and the oppression of people of color and how violent white supremacy is. And so when he did this, her the, 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 the demeanor of this dental hygienist changed, right? Because he chose not to act white. And she suddenly realized, oh, this is not a safe white person um, that I can share these type of ideals with, right? And then he followed it up. So not only do you choose not to act white, but how do you report it? How do you follow up with management at whatever company that you experience such a racist, some, someone saying something racist like this, right? And so there's all sorts of responses. You can, you can choose to just walk away, which a lot of people do because they don't want to deal with it. But at the end of the day, as a white person, how do you choose to not act white? And what kind of responsibility do you take on to ensure the appropriate people know about it, right? And that justice is, is redressed in some way. And so Charles, do you know how many um, Charles Mills wrote this poem. It's at the beginning of his chapter called uh, White Ignorance. And I'm going to read it. White ignorance, it's a big subject. How much time do you have? It's not enough. Ignorance is usually thought of as the passive observe to knowledge, the darkness retreating before the light, the spread of enlightenment. But imagine an ignorance that resists. Imagine an ignorance that fights back. Imagine an ignorance militant, aggressive, not to be intimidated, an ignorance that is active, dynamic, that refuses to go quietly, not at all confined to the illiterate and uneducated, but propagated at the highest levels of the land, indeed presenting itself unblushingly as knowledge. And so, you know, the dictionary definition of ignorance is this idea of absence of knowledge or lack of knowledge. The way in which the literature talks about white ignorance is actually knowledge, right? What, right? White ignorance is violence. White ignorance is the false belief and the absence of true belief. Is this idea that you're looking at the spread of misinformation. This is the idea of white ignorance. This is the idea of the racial contract, the way in which we oppress or suppress uh, racial subordination, right? And so this idea of white ignorance is the knowledge that has been passed down, this false belief, the spread of misinformation. And it doesn't need to be based on bad faith. And this is something I also want to emphasize, right? For example, at an individual level, I may not have prejudicial views, prejudicial views towards people of color. However, through the suppression of collective knowledge about certain historical facts, right? For example, even this idea of um, Christopher Columbus and how, how we, how the image that we, we portray of Christopher Columbus could be a positive image or a more realistic image, right? So the ways in which we suppress collective knowledge about historical facts, about um, the inequities happening in our community, individuals, right? It doesn't take bad faith, but individuals can engage in white ignorance and, and suppress collective knowledge, even though they may not have prejudicial, prejudicial views about themselves, right? Um, views of themselves or prejudicial views of people of color. Um, and so um, I, I want to emphasize this because we often think about impact versus intent versus impact, which I'm, I'm going to get to in a minute, but I think this is important. 
And so with critical whiteness research as a background, right, I've synthesized the critical whiteness research, I would like to read the words of Shoghi Effendi together. As to racial prejudice, the corrosion of which for well nigh a century has bitten into the fiber and attacked the whole social structure of American society. So after having synthesized this critical whiteness research, right, we can better understand and have a, a um, appreciate a better understanding of what does it mean that the corrosion of racial prejudice has bitten into the fiber and attacked the whole social structure of American society, which is why it should be regarded as constituting the most vital and challenging issue confronting the Baha'i community at the present stage of its evolution. And we can better understand why he urges us to focus our attention on ourselves, to address our personal deficiencies and weaknesses. And so from a white supremacist and whiteness perspective, we can get a glance of what that could 